Um, just a few little housekeeping things before we get uh, going. I'm ringing, so I better stop that from happening. <laughs> You'll notice outside around the, uh, the garden, there's quite a few signs about not stepping on the garden and stuff. And quite a few of you children, some of whom are not here, so I might actually say it when they are here, were stepping on the garden. And some of you actually stepped on some plants that got broken. So what we want to do is find out who. I'm on a, I'm on, no, no, it's not like that at all. <laughs> But I would like to raise the issue with the parents as to why um, you're not just keeping an eye on what your children are doing. And I'd also like to raise the issue with whoever has done that, maybe they'd like to talk with the owners about making reparation of the damage that was done in line with our previous discussion about responsibility. Does that sound all right? So what we'll do is we'll just wait until a few more come in before we start and, uh, oh, there's some plants broken outside. Yep. How's everyone today? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I just noticed when I'm feeling bad, you all seem to be feeling bad as well. What's going on with that? <laughs> You're relying on my uh, feeling good to feel good yourself, eh? Hey? What's going on there? Yeah, with regard, and seriously with regard to the children, if you do not know where your children are right now, my suggestion is to go and find them so that you do know where they are. And secondly, um, is to perhaps talk to them about just damaging the, the plants around the place because... Um, obviously, Peter is trying to sell the property and we don't want every weekend to be sp spending money fixing his property <laughs> um, while we're here. So if we could just bear that in mind, that would be good. Is that, is that everyone? It seems like half must have left. Was it, was it that boring, the first half, was it? Or? <laughs> the kids were great, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. Um, I really enjoy answering children's questions because um, a lot of times, I don't know if you've noticed, but they don't have any emotional investment in the answer. Whereas a lot of times as adults we have very large emotional investments in the answer and quite often when I've asked questions by adults, I can feel this heavy projection from the adult of please answer it the way I want you to answer it. <laughs> if you don't answer it the way I want you to answer it, then I'm going to be hurt or whatever it is, or I'm going to get angry with you or whatever. Whereas a child doesn't have those expectations, and so it's often really pleasant to be able to converse with children. In the first century, we used to... <coughs> myself and Mary used to rock up in a town when we were together, and uh, Mary hasn't had too many memories about this at this point, but... Um, so I don't want to say too much about it, but the, um, a lot of times what would happen is we'd go, the first thing, everyone in the town sometimes would be looking forward to seeing us, but we'd finish up playing with the children for a couple of hours first, and it used to drive the parents nuts, right? Uh, because they didn't want to play, and they thought that I should be more grown up, and play, and not play with the children and do what they wanted. And, and the, the problem with that, obviously, was they weren't learning the basics about being a child themselves. So there's a lot to learn from our children about how they're a child, how they play, what goes on. They're not, they're, they're not, af they're not afraid of... They're not, how many of you have been afraid of asking a question because you're afraid of what everyone will think of you? <laughs> like, now, today, many of our children weren't like that at all. Like, can you, so can you see where their emotion must come from by the time we're an adult? All this shame about like, how everyone perceives us and all of those different things. And yet, you know, the girls down, the three girls down here, they're not afraid about how people see you. They don't care. They're just having fun. They don't care how they're being perceived. They don't even care about lots of your projections of annoyance. They don't, do they? 
Like many of you are projecting that at them, but they don't care. They say, well, look, you're just distracting AJ now, and I don't feel distracted at all. I'm pretty happy. But they're, they're, uh, they're pretty happy to do it, but you're not. As a parent, why is that? Because you feel you're, you're not getting the attention you deserve being here. And not, there's a lot of emotions in this, right? And the key is to allow ourselves to feel our emotions about it all. But the beauty... <laughs> so Frank's, Frank's tuning in with his inner child now. <laughs> Good on you, Frank. The, uh, the beauty of doing it is that we finish up connecting with all of these parts of us that we've left behind. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, most of us have left our child, inner child behind. And so we don't hardly enjoy things anymore. And we don't know how to play anymore. And we don't know how to play without the, the feeling that somebody's going to judge us doing it. You know, we, we're, so, we're so embroiled in this thing that somebody's going to judge me. <laughs> we'll have... I'll have to start talking to the adults though at some point because I did promise them that they would be able to get some answers and questions. So we'll have to do that. <laughs> so you want to become an adult now, Frank? Is that the idea? I'm sorry? You want to become an adult now that you're going to miss out on. <laughs> All right, so what are we going to do now is open the questions to everyone else other than the children. Is that all right? So that way, uh, by the way, any of your children can still ask questions if you want, but... Um, but I want to answer some more general questions. And by the way, they can be anything about our lives, depending on whether Mary is willing to answer you. I'm perfectly happy. I'm very willing to answer any question. Too. Okay. So, fire away, Dennis. Um, earlier, when um, the young lady was speaking earlier, when she was talking where she had spirits that she saw, heard... And Anna Lee, you mean, uh, who yeah. was speaking? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, it, it was quite, I felt quite, um, it was quite painful. Right. That um, I watched a, I was doing some juicing and Kim put a doc, uh, sorry. Uh, is the mic on? Is that, is that better? That's sorry. Better. That's right. Yeah, um, I was watching a, uh, I, I was doing some juicing and Kim put Oprah on the television. Yeah. And, um, there was this family in, a, in America, and their daughter was, they, they diagnosed her as schizophrenic and put her on all this stuff. <coughs> and um, I could just feel that there was all these, you know, she was talking to spirits. She had pet dogs, cats, friends all around her, and they were just drugging her. And they put, when they took her to hospital, there was another girl there with her. And that was the only time that she was at peace. Right. Because they, they were both in the same place. Yeah. And I just, what can, what can we do about things like that? Do you mean what can you do personally? Yeah, whatever, uh, okay. yeah. And um, what was that? <laughs> now, can you kids take this up the back? You, yes. Is that all right? Yes. Because the adults are really struggling to keep concentration. You know what they're like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it? That's all right. Can you feel your projections at the children, though? Like, many of you were just projecting, like, this stuff staff at them still, you know, like, I can't concentrate, I can't concentrate, I can't hear what's going on. And, and a lot of that is just our stuff as, as parents and adults. The children are totally able to, uh, to enjoy themselves and, uh, and I, I think it's good to see them doing so. <laughs> Getting back to your question, Dennis. Um, there's a lot you can do to help any person who's being diagnosed with any type of men mental distress. Because all mental illnesses and distress are all basically caused by spirit interaction. So all these so-called you know, identity disorders, uh, a lot of psychosis type things, 
where a person just switches into a different personality and stays in that personality for the rest of their life. And a lot of stuff like schizophrenia, which is obviously very much spirit influenced, and manic depression and those other illnesses are heavy spirit influenced illnesses. And there's a number of different things you can do. One is with the spirits that are involved and the other is with the person. Now, when the person's in a state where they're um, heavily influenced, it's often very, very difficult to help them in that state until you can relieve them of some of their spirit influence. So what, what I did in the first century was, and what I do most of the time now and when we're together, is we focus on making sure, firstly, that we can talk to the spirits who are actually influencing the person. A few weeks ago we, uh, we, had a, we were staying at uh, Carol's at Heaven in the Hills and there was a group of women there meeting who had disassociative identity disorder, what you would call multiple personality disorder. They were all up at the, uh, they were doing uh, what kind of thing they were doing? Mosaic work. Mosaic work, that's right. And, uh, and one of them heard Carol talk to one of them and one of them decided to visit us. She came down at 11 o'clock or 11.30 at night and knocked on our door and myself and Mary were sitting in the bath at the time. And That's uh, a funny story actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to tell the whole story? Or? <laughs> because uh, Mary was actually dealing with a lot of fear that day about spirits and while she was in the bath, in, in fear by the way, um, we get this knock on the door at 11.30 at night, right? <laughs> And, uh, and I go, like, we look at each other, who's, who's knocking on our door at 11.30? I, I'd watched, in the afternoon, I'd watched Emily Rose and then I'd laid on the bed and shook and cried for an hour or so. And then we had a bath and then it was 11.30 and there's a knock on the door. Anyway, this lady um, who, I opened the door um, in my towel <laughs> and uh, this lady said, oh, I need to talk with you and I could feel like she's heavily spirit influenced, like seven or eight spirits just, just impressing upon her. And in fact, that she was heavily spirit influenced even in coming down and knocking on our door. So I could feel that we weren't really even talking to the lady herself. And anyway, um, I said, yeah, just give us a few moments to put some clothes on. And she, we invited her in, she sat down and we, we got dressed and and we talked with her um, about her life and so much of her life was governed by her spirits, almost all of her life in fact. This is why she'd been recently diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder. So what she found herself doing was going into different ages like constantly, you've probably seen this occur, right? Where a person goes from one age to another age to another age in a conversation even, sometimes you notice it occurring. And, um, and she was fluctuating between this young girl, I think about four or five, I don't know, you, you have a better feeling about the age. But yeah, the, the, no, she was only two or three. Two or three, yeah. Um, who had been with her most of her life and, uh, and then some other people and a man, even a man was with her who she was very, uh, she was very handy with her hands, this lady. And, when this man overcloaked her, she became like the carpenter, you know, and off she went and did all the carpentry around the house and did all of this work. And then when he stopped overcloaking her, another spirit stepped in and she became, uh, she did a lot of what they were doing. And, and um, in the end, uh, it was very difficult talking with her. We had to just, because there were so many people there, in, like, and she was switching between so many people. So all we could do is really talk with her about like the truth that she was connected with spirits. You know you're connected with spirits, don't you? Yes, was her answer. What do you feel about your, you know, diagnosis as dis with disassociative identity disorder? Oh, she said, I know it's spirits. Like, but, you know, nobody's going to believe me. Like, and, uh, and so we had a bit of a conversation with her for about a half an hour, three quarters of an hour, would it have been, would it? And it was quite a good conversation in the end. We managed to talk about a fair bit of truth. And, uh, and she left. She went, she went. She felt a lot calmer. We talked to her about the different spirits with her and why they were with her emotionally. And she left a lot calmer. And then at three o'clock in the morning, you want to describe what happened next? Uh, we just woke up, or I woke up, and I could feel that one of the spirits that was with the lady, this young girl, 
uh, was with me and um, so I woke AJ up and I told him because uh, this was really my first experience of mediumship and I was like, I don't know what's happening but I, I was the words were out of my mouth before I was even properly awake that this young girl was with us. And so... Um, we just were able to talk to the little girl about what was happening for her and managed to be able to get her to move with some celestial spirits that came to help her. Mm. Yeah, and um, th yeah. And then uh, there were some other experiences straight after that, but that was the one concerning the lady. And then, um, and then what happened was that uh, in the morning she came back down, this lady came back down, and she said, oh, for the first time in my life, I have, from the moment I've awoken this morning, I have not heard a voice. Right? From the first time in my life. And then she started sobbing her heart out, like crying. And she said, oh, and I really miss them. Right? So she, she was, and really in particular, missing this, uh, this young girl who she knew had moved on through the night. She felt her go as well. So, um, the issue, firstly, a lot of times is actually helping the spirits with the person whom you can talk to whether you can hear them or not, you can talk to at any time. So whenever you notice somebody who's got that state, the first thing to do is talk with the spirits around the person. And it doesn't really matter if the person understands you or not at that point. Talk with the spirits around them. When you get to a state of one with God, what will happen is you'll be able to just project a feeling of love for the person and the spirits will automatically leave her, leave the person. But that does not deal with the attraction. And that's the issue you've got. Now this lady still didn't deal with the attraction. She had a deep longing for this inner child part of her which was lost based on a heap of abuse and this girl was abused in very similar ways. Um, the lady was locked up in cupboards for long periods of time when she was a little child. She would, she would finish up going to the toilet in the cupboard and, and everything, just being locked in a cupboard. And, and so she'd lost a lot of her childhood um, in that way. And of course, this little girl, had, 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 she had died from abuse. This little girl that actually died, was actually murdered by her parents and, uh, and attracted to her. And so, um, I don't know if she was murdered by her parents, but she's abused to death basically by her parents. And, and, and so the two were attracted to each other. And, um, and so the lady herself, until she heals that emotion of the loss of her childhood, the loss of her innocence and a lot of other connected emotions, she's obviously going to attract another spirit who's in the same space. And because she is so mediumistic, this lady, the adult lady is so mediumistic, it's going to, she's probably going to have the voices start up again at some point. And so it's a two-pronged thing that we need to do to assist people. The first thing is to assist the spirits who are connecting to the person as much as you can. The second thing is to assist the person to disconnect their em emotionally from the spirits. Now, is Alex still here? Where's Alex? Oh, yeah, there you are. We were thinking, I was thinking too of that, uh, that thing that happened uh, while you were at our place the other day with your, dad, with your grandfather. Um, Alex's grandfather is pretty connected with Alex and Alex's grandfather wants Alex to do things that Alex's grandfather did when he was on earth and because Alex is highly mediumistic and also quite often wants to get away from his emotion, his grandfather easily connects and, and influences Alex into doing things. Um, and, and when we tried to talk to Alex's grandfather, he didn't want to talk at all. Now under those circumstances, there is nothing you can do to help the spirit very much if they refuse all contact. The best thing you can do is help the person, in this case Alex, to make a different choice emotionally. Does that make sense? To make the choice from, from getting away from his emotions into getting into his emotions. When he does that, that spirit, his grandfather, will no longer be able to influence him. So there's a lot you can do. Um, even if you can't hear spirits, there's a lot you can do. Even if the person is on the opposite side of the world, there's a lot you can do. Just praying for the person from your heart and talking to God and then talking to the spirits that you feel are there 
has a huge effect on those spirits. There's experiments even with uh, forgiveness that people have done where people who are in mental asylums have, have been forgiven and all of a sudden they no longer have those problems. And the reason why is because the spirits themselves felt the feeling of somebody desiring to forgive them and that caused the spirit to get into their own emotions. So there's a lot you can do to help people who are heavily influenced in that way. Thank you. Um, AJ, I've just got a question about my two children, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> two girls who are now 22 and 29, uh -huh. and they live in Melbourne. And I moved up from Melbourne five years ago, and I felt really happy and buoyant about that decision and brought my younger daughter with me. Yeah. Um, she moved back after a year. Um, I'm feeling lots of guilt about not being with my children, even though they're adults. Mm -hmm. And I also feel grief about not sort of being with them and sharing with them, apart from on the phone and the few visits. And I'm just wondering if my moving up here was an act of love of myself and of love of them. Um, my feelings are it doesn't matter what, whether it was an act of love of yourself or love of them or even selfishness. All that matters is what, how do you deal with the emotion that's coming up for you right now. So you said the emotion is guilt, right? And grief, yeah. Well, guilt, yeah. Well, guilt is a covering emotion, obviously. So that's the first thing to understand. So guilt is covering over what? Now, you say you also feel grief. But what's the grief about? Um, I think it's about not... Um, receiving from them and connecting with them. My younger daughter's really connected well with the mother of the no okay, one so, of her friends. Okay, so in your mind it's about not connecting with children, right? Now does that sound like a causal emotion to you? No, maybe abandonment is. Right, so, so this emotion is an actual trigger emotion, it's, not, it's the effect emotion. So you're at, when you grieve <coughs> this loss of connection with your children, you're actually not in a causal emotion. You're in an emotion of self-delusion, self really, right? A self-deception emotion. And guilt is also a self-deception emotion. It's an emotion that gets you away from real causal deep emotional pain. So... Both of those emotions don't actually need to be felt. But you're choosing to feel them. And the reason why you're choosing to feel them is because the emotions that they cover are more painful than those two emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what we need to do is get to identify the, these ones, the blank ones that I've got here in these boxes, right? Those emotions are the ones that we need to connect to somehow. So... What is the guilt about? Um, that I'm not there and sharing and giving. I've got a friend who's really so connected with her kids and said she'd never leave Melbourne and, you know, she'll always be there for them, you know, even though they're almost adults. And so could you say it's not a good mum, being a good mum? Yeah. yeah. Now, that's not a causal emotion no. either, is it? So can you see we're still not getting anywhere near to what the causal emotion is. So your guilt is about not being a good mum and what, it, what that means, you know. To you, in your mind, a good mum would be connected to her daughters, you know, in their daughter's life, the daughter wants to be in their life and so forth and so forth, right? That's part of the belief you have about what a good mum would be. Okay. So we still are not at the <laughs> causal emotion. But these are the feelings that you feel that trigger your guilt and this is the feeling you feel that triggers your grief. So at least we're somewhere, we're at least identifying something at this point. So what else can we add to that? Um, I felt really abandoned by my parents. And okay, now you're starting to get mm. closer to what the causal emotion is about, right? I want to connect with my children a lot of the times because I actually feel abandoned by my own parents and I don't want to feel that feeling. And that's the real grief that I need to feel. 
Does that make sense? And that's more than likely the real emotion we could fit in here. Grief about how your life was and how your life was when you were a child trying to connect to parents that they didn't want you and so forth, right? That's the grieving emotion that you need to allow yourself to feel. Ironically, when you feel that emotion, you will automatically feel more connected to your own children. And they, by the way, automatically more connected with you. And you'll actually find that they'll contact you just as much as you contact them then. It'll be more of a relationship rather than just a mothering thing mm. going on. Does that make sense? Once you work through the causal emotion, which is related to the grief, so it's still grief, right? But it's not about your children. It's about you as a child with your parent. That's what it's really about. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now, on the guilt side, what do you think that one might be? Um, so the feeling inside of you is, I'm not a good mum. Well, I'm not giving enough. Like, the only way my mother had an identity was to give to her children. Um, she didn't work or have a good relationship with my father. Or what happens if you don't give to somebody? It's like, you know, I think I said a few months ago that I wanted to stop counselling because I, there was some burnt out feelings. I feel I need, my soul needs a rest. Yep. And even not helping the kitchen today, I felt, oh, Lorleen's going to hate me, you know, I'm not helping her. And whereas I, you know, so... So what do you think you're going to lose if you don't give? Um, love and support and... Okay, so really underneath all of this guilt is a lot of grief about... So a lot of grief, again, about about love and what is connotated by the word yeah. love, isn't it? I don't feel I'll get love if I don't give. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so guilt is your way of getting out of that emotion. You see, when I, I construct guilt because really I feel like nobody's going to love me unless I do exactly what they want, right? And I don't want to grieve that. I don't want to grieve the fact that nobody loves me. Mm. Nobody loves me. You, you stop doing what everyone around you wants and you see how many people are happy with you. Like, trust me, you try this as an experiment. Stop doing what everyone around you wants and just feel your emotions about what they project at you. And you're going to get lots of anger, rage, judgment. You'll get all sorts of emotions, right? They're the emotions you're avoiding. And the way to avoid them is to tell yourself that you're the person who's wrong. That's what guilt is. You're now the not a good mum. You're the person who's wrong. I'm sorry, but you're not the person who's wrong. All you need to do is grieve the false belief you have within you that love earns love. And that's a false belief, right? That needs to be grieved. But often what we do is that is so painful. When, when we come face to face with that, we realise that actually most of us have never been loved all of our life. In our child life, never been loved, right? And so what we finish up doing is we don't want to feel how much that hurts, mm. right? So what we do instead is we tell ourselves that, we're bad. that it was my fault that I wasn't loved. You get that? See, if it becomes my fault that it's not loved, then I don't, then I don't have... To, I'm punishing myself now, remember? I'm punishing myself now rather than grieving about what happened. Now, punishment of self is just as bad as punishment of someone else. Can you see that? If I am angry with myself, that is just as bad a place as if I am angry with someone else. From God's perspective, I am angry with somebody, <laughs> whether it's myself or someone else, is really immaterial. You follow me? So... The guilt allows you to get away with being upset with yourself and angry with yourself, right? Rather than just grieving the fact that you haven't been loved yourself. Now, when you release that, the guilt, like what defines a good mum, what defines a good dad, what defines a good sister, what defines a good brother, what defines a good husband, what defines a good wife, what defines a good child, all of that starts disappearing and you just be yourself instead. And if part of being yourself is I desire to have a relationship with my daughters, you will desire it and it will be constructed. But it won't be constructed out of guilt. It'll be constructed because you now have grieved the love within that, that you've lost and you'll now be in a space where you can love. 
rather than earn love. Mm -hmm. At the moment, a lot of your life has been defined around earning it mm -hmm. rather than being it. And there's a big difference between those two states. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for many of you, by the way, many of you have been exactly the same. You've had to earn every scrap of love you've ever gotten. For many of us, that's the case, right? We've earned every single scrap of love that we've received. And so what does that teach us? It teaches us that there's no such thing as a gift of love. And until I get, give something to someone else, I'm never going to be loved. That's what it teaches us. And we go into spaces of guilt in order to avoid the pain of that emotion because it's a, a very painful emotion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I judge myself a lot. So would that be classes, um, well, being angry at myself? Yes. So how do I, do I need to, um, do I need to process that anger? Um, that I have towards myself or... No. Uh, well, how do, I <laughs> okay, how do I get below that then? Well, it's a good thing you've asked this question because this is exactly the thing I'm working through the last two weeks. <laughs> so I can answer this one fairly well. What I found with myself was that I have huge amounts of self-punishment emotions, which are to do with, like in my case, I don't have the same intelligence as I used to have. I don't have the same body I used to have. I'm not as good in bed as I used to be. I'm not, like, this is in terms of how you are in the spirit world, right? I'm not, um, I'm not as knowing about everything. I'm not in the space of love that I used to be in. I'm not in the space of knowing the truth that I used to know. Now, can you start to see that basically every area of my life is basically stuffed? That's how it feels. It feels like I've lost absolutely everything inside of myself, right? absolutely everything I used to be, I'm not now. And by the way, many of you still project it at me, which is a rem my law of attraction. He can't be Jesus because he's not what I imagined Jesus to be, right? That often comes back at me as well. So I'm getting this huge projection from people on earth and also in the spirit world, there's this large numbers of people uh, looking at me and saying, yeah, he's Jesus and he, he screwed up my life as well. Like, so there's all these spirits in the spirit world who are religious when they're on earth who thought they were practicing or following Jesus and they were actually following all these other people and, and not me at all, but they blame it all on me and it's my fault, that's the way they feel. And so I take on all that as well. Does that make sense? So there's all this projection of anger and rage towards me. And on top of that, I know that I'm not the same person that I used to be. I know that I'm slowly getting back to the same person that I used to be, and, but I know that even my soulmate, when she first saw me, and I, I can understand this, when she first saw me, she said to me, four days into our time together, Vinya Babe, you said, you're not the same man I remember. I know it's you, but it's not the same man I remember. And so that emotion just gets getting triggered in me. I'm not as good as I used to be. I'm not as good as I used to be. So what happened was I always getting into self-punishment, like really anger with myself. So whenever I can't remember something that I used to be able to remember and I know the answer to somewhere there and yet I can't remember the answer, I get frustrated and angry with myself and get really down with myself about processing emotions sometimes and very angry with myself, as Mary will attest to, about when I've had an emotion that I've had over years, you know, I'm very angry about different parts of my body not being healed yet and why they're not healed and really upset about all those things. So all of that is really anger with self. Does that make sense? Now you have many of these same emotions, right? Where you're not as good as you want to be, you know, you're not as intelligent as you want to be, you're not as good looking as you wanted to be, you know, you don't have the body that you wanted, you know, or you lost it or whatever, all these different things. Now, anger with self is just as damaging to yourself emotionally, and in some ways I feel perhaps even more so, than anger with others. Right? Now, what's under the anger with self is fear of self. 
Does that make sense? And what's under fear of self is, what do you think? Um, Grief. What, what exactly do you mean fear of self? I'm afraid to really see myself as I truly am right now because when I look at myself as I truly am right now, I am just a shell of what I used to be. Does that make sense? And for many people, they feel the same way, right? As you grow older, a lot of times you feel these emotions like you wished you were 20 again or 21 again. Mind you, you wish that with, your, with all of the things you learnt over the last, you know, now that you're 50, but you still think that it would be nice to have the body of the 20-year-old and, you know, many, many of you ladies, when you see a, a nice young woman walk past you, you feel a bit of jealousy come up. <laughs> I wished I had that body, you know what I mean? Like, in my current state, that would be wonderful. That's all just a fear of looking at yourself in the end. And under the fear of seeing yourself is the terrible grief you feel. And what I've found is that if I can stay in this place here, I can release causal emotion really rapidly. But if I get out of this place and start getting afraid of this grief, then I straight away kick into the anger with self and I can get really harsh on myself in that place, really angry and upset with myself. Right? And in the past, in my progression, I've, I've even hit myself or punched myself in that state. Right? Taken to an extreme, it can take you to a suicide, that emotion. Um. So I have problems with recognising whether or not I'm in a causal emotion or, you know, whatever else above that. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, actually, I don't really even need to ask this question, but I could just pray to God about it, you know. Yeah, that's true. Um, that you could. Yeah. Um, all, all I've done is this. All I've done is I've focused on, all right, I'm angry with myself. I am in avoidance. Why am I in avoidance? because I'm afraid of feeling this grief. So my best choice is to actually start feeling the grief, to start feeling the grief about myself, what I don't like about myself. But instead of being angry about it, crying about it, grieving it. All right. So in my case, like, I've, I've had to cry about how unattractive I feel com compared, like, for Mary. So. So whenever I think about it, I allow myself to think about it. And instead of, pre what I used to do was punish myself for it. Like, so, I'd, so I'd be really upset with myself about it, get really angry with myself about it. What I do now when I feel that emotion is I just grieve it. Um, we watched the Travelers, Time Travelers Wife movie. Who's seen the Time Travelers Wife? Good movie. It's been really good for myself and Mary. We were both really triggered in the movie and Mary was sobbing through most of it. There's a lot of our life in that movie and, uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of emotions for us to work through and we were severely disappointed we couldn't go and get a video and, <laughs> and go home straight away and process some more. And we got kicked out of the movie theatre processing. But anyway, <laughs> um, um, but the, it was just so good because it had a lot of emotions in it that, that connected me with this terrible feeling that I had about myself. Um, in, one, in one scene, the, lady, the, the, the wife says to the husband, do you think that anybody would want to choose a life that I'm living with you? Right? And that just got me like completely done <laughs> because that, that's how I feel inside of myself, that nobody in their right minds would ever choose to be my partner and to live the life that, that you know, I'm, I'm faced with living, basically. And uh, so that's an emotion I feel about myself. Does that make sense? But I don't often want to feel that grief and so I get angry with myself about what I am instead of just crying about what I am. But what I'm finding now, now that I'm in this space, it's really quite, I can feel myself working through the emotions quite rapidly now because of it rather than being in this place. Yeah. Avani, can I just add as well as, as those things, um, at times I've gotten into anger with myself because I've seen that I've done something that's unloving um, and 
in my family, if, some, if I punish myself, then I'm less likely to be punished by someone else. Um, and so I would get into this punishing thing. But this whole anger with self and self-punishment was keeping me very, very far away from the causal reason why I'd take the un I had taken the unloving action. Do you know what I mean by that? Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's just another thing to keep in mind if you're getting angry with yourself a lot. That really helped me. Um, in the end, it's still grief about yourself, but it's not necessarily um, as smooth sailing from the, from the top to the bottom because there's a lot of vested interest within ourselves to avoid the reasons why we want to be unloving. Yeah. Um, so if, I'm, if I release... Well, um, no, actually, if I stop being angry with myself, does that mean that I'll automatically um, have less anger towards other people as well? Um, probably not. <laughs> because, because anger with self and anger with other people come from different sources of grief. And so anger with self generally is fear about yourself. Anger with others is usually fear about um, what they're triggering inside of or reminding yourself of yourself. But, it, but at the end of the day, there's also a causal reason why we get angry with others that's different to a reason of why we get angry with ourselves. Our desire to get angry with others is about not wanting to take personal responsibility for our life. And that's something that we often have a heightened sense of doing when we get angry with ourselves. So they come from the two flip, they're the flip side of the same emotion, I suppose you could say. Anger with self is because we don't want to feel our grief. Anger with others is because we still don't want to feel our grief. But anger with others comes from this additional injury that we want to blame another person for our grief. Right? Whereas, uh, whereas uh, for myself, that's never been a major trouble. I've always focused on me being to blame for anything that's inside of me. Um, Whereas a lot of times when we get angry with others, what we're doing is we're focusing on them being to blame for what's inside of me or what's being triggered in me. Does that make sense? There's a big so there's an additional emotion, that's what I'm saying, that creates <laughs> anger with others that isn't there when we create anger with self. <laughs> and I had um, in terms of the anger with others, I had a really powerful experience with repentance about that. Um, so I just um, uh, was triggered by something and I, I went into a state of being really repentant about feeling what my anger does to other people and talking to God about that and since then I'm not going to say that I never get angry anymore but I, I noticed a really big difference around that mm. yeah cool thank you um, I do have another question um, so over the last few days I've been doing some processing oh actually I should start with I really love drawing <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've been processing and like grieving about stuff, but then I have these images of cartoon characters that <laughs> come like just like a sketch of a character, no like colours or anything. And um, I actually, because I went down to one of the processing rooms before, and um, yeah, I actually thought um, maybe I have a like a young spirit or something with me that is. Um, giving me those images but it's really sort of inspired me to draw more yeah. and like silly little <laughs> um, cartoon type things but I was just wondering what you guys might know or like think about that sort of thing. Why do you want to know what we think about that? Um, I don't, to confirm what I'm thinking. <laughs> Why don't you just trust what you're thinking? Because I don't trust myself much at all. And that's what you need to learn to do. Yeah. So my suggestion is rather than us say and answer, you trust what you're thinking. Okay. And also allow yourself to develop this little talent that's happening between okay. you and the spirit <laughs> and just let yourself develop it. All right. Yeah. Cool. You enjoy it, so follow yep. through with it. Often you'll be your most creative while you're dealing with different emotions. Like... Quite often I'll be dealing with some emotions and then shortly afterwards this whole inspiration of, a, of different things come to me and I go, I go up, up, to the, up to our house and away I go typing up another outline. that you Often, often the outlines that you get are, complete, are the result of an after emotion processing inspiration. Yeah, because yeah, um, yeah, there's been quite a few times when I... Because I, I, I like to be in the dark and I have my eyes closed obviously while I'm crying and... Um, 
yeah, and even sometimes, like when I was lying up the back before, I just, um, and even just looking at the floor sometimes, these little images just pop up. Yeah. It's just weird, yeah, yeah. but it's cool. Yeah. Yep. So let, let it all happen and trust your feelings. You, you, I th you're in the right track, but I'm not going to say any more than that. Okay. okay? <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, could we go to Graham and then across to... Hey Jay, I'm in a quandary. Um, you were talking about grief there before, and, and I'd just been talking Karen about, uh, no, sorry, about guilt. And I was talking to Karen before about how I was feeling guilty about how her short term loan to the sanctuary hasn't been paid back. Right. And about how I feel, you know, that, that you know, there's been a bit of unloving stuff going on about the sanctuary, and, 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 I, I feel, and then, then I was feeling about that, and then I realised that I got under that just while you were talking, and I realised it was my old issue of wanting to rescue women. And, but, so it would seem like, I sh like I'd basically been contemplating giving Karen some money, and... But then I'm thinking, well, if I'm not going to rescue women, I shouldn't. So, but then the guilt comes up, and then, and, and I don't know whether I'm Arthur or Martha at the moment about this. <laughs> you well, look like an Arthur anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> Come on, mate. Um, firstly, guilt is not the causal emotion. Obviously, you know that. Yeah. And you started to get into some causal emotion that caused you to feel like you wanted to talk to Karen. But there's, there's other things happening as well within the situation. I'm going to give my brief thing because I know you're going to go further. But um, you can also feel that there's some unloving behaviour happening, can't you? There's unloving behaviour towards Karen. But your solution that you've come up with is to give Karen some money. And you found the emotion that's driving that, and that's the emotion of wanting to rescue women. But that doesn't change that there's unloving behaviour happening. So there's still more emotions to process as to why you would prefer to give Karen the money rather than deal with the fact that there's unloving behaviour happening. And what, what's your next step if you know that there's unloving behaviour happening? Um, well, I've contemplated... Um saying something on the forum about it mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned to Karen that I was contemplating doing that but I don't know what else there is I could do. Right, so, so this gets and perhaps we'll answer some of these questions in the morning when we talk to, about the sanctuary but let's look at it more generally from an act of love perspective. If somebody makes a promise then the promise should be kept no matter what personal sacrifice is involved in the promise unless the original promise was unloving towards yourself. Now in the case of money being loaned to, to you for any purpose obviously you're making a promise that it's going to be paid back. Now, now so it needs to be paid back. Now the other thing that's happened is that some of you have spent quite a lot of money on the sanctuary whereas others of you have spent nothing on the sanctuary but still enjoy it. Um, enjoy being there when you're doing your processing, right? And so there are different emotions involved that are going to be involved for each one who's involved in those particular things with the sanctuary. There's a group of people who bought the property, which actually, who actually bought the property out of their generosity. But look at why did they buy the property? What, what was your underlying emotions as to why you purchased the property? Was it to own it? Or was it to provide it for others to work through their emotions or what was the underlying purpose? And when you look at what the underlying purpose is for some, it's going to be different than it was for others. Do you know what I mean? And also, um, obviously, any loans that were given to you for the property were done specifically for the purpose that you enabled you to get the property. And if, they were, if there was a promise that it would be paid back, then that obviously needs to occur. So there is a feeling, like Mary pointed out, that there is guilt, that that hasn't happened. So that's the guilt feeling. So, so that guilt feeling is triggered by a truth. And the truth is, 
we made a promise that we haven't kept. So that's a very truth feeling, isn't it? We should always keep our promises and whenever we don't keep our promises, we're going to feel bad about that. But it's also a truth that nobody wants to fulfil their promise. Because if they all wanted to fulfil their promise, it wouldn't be something that would you'd be triggered with guilt about because you would have already fulfilled the promise of paying back. Does that make sense? So there must be some underlying emotional reasons why that occurs what, that Mary has pointed to as well. Not just in yourself, Graham, but in everyone involved in the sanctuary. Does that make sense? Now perhaps some of the people involved in the sanctuary don't know about this. I don't know what has been told of the sanctuary. I, I've only just recently got on the sanctuary email address list myself. But um, perhaps not many people know that this was a promise that was made. But even those people who knew about the promise should at least already be doing something about fulfilling it. And how that's fulfilled, well, obviously it's more important to fulfill a promise than it is to build a dam on the property, than it is to build a, a you know, water collection thing on the property. And that, in fact, it's to do with anything on the property. It's more important to fulfill a promise than any of those things. And so this is where we get down to love in the end. You see, a lot of the times what we do is we go through our minds and we go through, oh, yeah, but you know, we owe her, I don't know how much I owe, like let's say it's 50000 right? We owe her $50,000, um, but for $50,000, like we could put in five tanks, we could put in a bit of shed, we can, we can dig a hole, make a dam, you know, get a bulldozer driver in and all these other things we could do. That would be really beneficial too, but we're forgetting a major point and that is if we made a promise, the loving thing to do is to keep it. And that's the guilt that's triggering this emotion for you. The guilt is the truth and that is the promise has been made and it hasn't been fulfilled. But the reason why you want to fulfill it <laughs> is completely different than the group wanting to fulfill it. Can you see that? Like your personal reason for wanting to fulfill it is based around you wanting to look after a woman's sadness. Right? Now one thing Karen needs to do is to actually talk to the entire group about the fact that her, pro her promise hasn't been fulfilled. And so that's something that she will need to address, right? And talk to the entire group about why her promise hasn't been fulfilled. Is that loving? What's going on? What do you want to do about that? Does that make sense? But you taking personal responsibility for that promise now is definitely an issue to do with mum and how much she has you know, push, pushed you a lot into taking personal responsibility for her emotions. Yeah. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't be a part of the solution, but I am saying that you do need to let yourself feel the emotion of guilt and what is underneath that and a lot of the things Mary's have listed for you are underneath that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we were going across to Laura. Um, AJ and Mary, um, uh, I understand what it is to condemn oneself and to punish oneself. I yeah, know that very well. You're really good at it. Yes, yeah. I'm very good at Join it. Join the club, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so with all of that, and um, I have spent time now letting go of that, and it took different ways of just relaxing and just because I knew when I realised that I was escaping through that, because I didn't need to deal with it, I just beat myself up and then I didn't have to feel anything except being beaten up. I got into sort of an anger, but I knew I was angry because I realised I've been angry all my life probably. And, and then I did all these things of facing the fears and I did the movies and my light law attractions and it's coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And right now I feel like I'm one big whole fear. And it's like I realise in this state of fear there's a couple of things going on that um, I'm so afraid of everything. My whole life is a reaction through all these fears um, that being so scared of everything, I'm also beginning not to be scared, if you know what I mean. You're desensitising yourself to your own fear. Oh, is that what I'm doing? <laughs> Because I was wondering, because the processing hasn't started yet. I've just got to the huge fear state. And um, I was wondering 
how to get down further onto that. But now I see the fears because before it was totally head in the sand thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, but I'm aware now that I'm afraid this, 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 and the list gets bigger and longer and longer and longer. And mm -hmm. each time I write more about it, it gets more, you know, involved. Yeah. So, um, yes, it's like being afraid of my fears almost. It's like, you know, I can't, I, I probably can go further with the fears. But I'm wondering, sometimes I'm so overwhelmed with it all, you know, like, oh, where will I go with this? Um, and I understood that one way that it, it's the soul expanding, but at the same time it's like it's so huge that I can't move. Is that now, how do I, you know, go from there to the grief? Because it's just, it's bigger and bigger and... And I'm so scared that it's going to explode and I'm just going to go splattering everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, let can it I, explode. <laughs> can I just ask how many other sort of you feel exactly the same way as just what got described there? Yeah, quite a few. So you've got quite a few friends, right? Do you want to answer that one back? Because it's sort of the line of what you've been dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Because yeah. Mary's been in a very similar state. Um, feeling exactly the same kind of feelings. Feeling like the fear of everything is just overwhelming. Yeah. And, and in that place, I just, I lived in that place. It, and that's, that's what I call living in your fear. I'm afraid of everything. I can tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of this, who we are, all of you. We're all gonna, I'm going to be attacked. It's all going to, you know. I'm going to die. We'll, he'll be dead. I'll be alone. Uh, uh, all of that. So I could tell you all of that for about eight months. Anytime anyone had asked me an emotion, yep, I'm afraid of all these things. But I wasn't processing any of them. In fact, I was living in them and I was letting myself be defined by them. So the first thing I did was realise that 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 wasn't helping anything and actually knowing what I was afraid of d d wasn't actually helping my soul at all if I wasn't doing anything with it except saying, oh, I can't feel that because I'll, then I'll just open my heart to you and you'll die anyway. And, you know, I was using my fears as a way <laughs> to get away from everything else. So she found that she was using her fears as an excuse. Does that make sense? We often do this. We use our fears as an excuse to get away from acting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and one day AJ said to me, when are you going to let all the balls drop? You're just juggling everything, you're keeping everything, you know, just where it is, just so you can just manage everything. When are you just going to let it all drop on the ground? That's why I said just let it explode. Because you, you've got to feel how it feels to feel... I've got all of these fears. I'm absolutely terrified. God, how can I get through this? That I, it really helped um, acknowledging how afraid I was, how alone I felt and how overwhelmed I felt by it all actually helped me take a step closer to God and God reliance because I just sat with this is how it is and it's very hard, like... I, grief overwhelmed me in that place and still does, you know. The fact, it, it was a feeling of hopelessness because of all of that. But I, I had to recognise firstly that what I was doing, just living in the fear, wasn't helping me. And I had to, I guess, reach a place where I wanted to feel no matter what I was going to feel. There's also this, this phase, part of this phase was, <coughs> for Mary, was and it's been the same for myself, where you're actually willing to cr cry about how afraid you are. Yeah. So most people are not willing to cry about how afraid they are. What they do is they feel their terror and they feel their fear, but they're not willing to actually go into tears about how afraid they are. And once Mary started to allow herself to go into the tears about how afraid she was, then some of her fear started getting released. Does that make sense? And so what I've noticed happen with Mary over the last four months is that, as, as you can imagine, Mary's got lots and lots, like I've had too, lots and lots of fears to release to, to, to on the path. And the more you're allowing yourself to cry about how afraid you are, the less your fear becomes and the more you allow the grief. You see, 
the fear is there because you're afraid of the grief. You're afraid of the tears in the end. You're afraid of how overwhelming those tears are going to be. Once you, once you start crying about how afraid you are, you're starting to let the tap go on what you're actually afraid about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, the unfortunate thing for me is that I do understand that um, and because I know it, it's like I knew I was living in it and I got to that point where I said I'm living in this and I'm escaping in living in it because you explained at one time the difference of processing and, and living mm -hmm. and, and then I, I realised too that I'm so afraid of the grief underneath because I know my life and it's just horrendous for me and so... I know that and then I do talk to God and I do try to cry about my fear of every single thing you can imagine but I still feel that I'm wondering if it's I just have to keep doing that you know because I I've only just come to this point actually mm. you know and so do I just keep doing that well you've seen yourself get out of your anger now and into your fear so you know you've progressed right so you definitely know you've progressed. You've gotten out of the anger place and into your fear place, which is progress, by the way. Most people think it's not, but it is. Right? But, but what needs to happen now is to get out of the fear place and into the grief place. And that means allowing, some of the, allowing yourself to grieve about how frightened you are. Like you're just very frightened. You're very frightened about what's going to come up, how much it's going to come up. As you said, you know your life and everything. And, and you're very, very frightened about what's going to come up as a result. So my suggestion is to start allowing yourself to actually feel what's the worst about the worst. Allow yourself to feel what you feel is the worst of all this. Like, what's the worst possible thing that could happen here? And then allow yourself to start crying about what's the worst possible thing that could happen. It doesn't mean to be it's something that will happen, just what you feel will happen what you imagine will happen and allow yourself to start connecting to that. So what, it, what is it that you imagine will happen here? When you start feeling your grief, what's going to happen? Like, What do you feel? What are you afraid of here? Um, well, I guess when I listen to all the stories that are here and um, I, I feel that, yes, I've got that, I've got that, I've, <laughs> I've got everything here. And, um, and there's a whole lot that I don't even know. And, and I just think, well, if I can feel the intellectual grief of knowing this, so if I... If but, I but what's going to happen when you drop all of these balls? When you just let everything go? When you let every, everything in your life just go? What's going to happen? What are you afraid of, really? I'm not talking about now the individual things. I'm talking about what's going to happen when all of this just comes and hits you, when you explode, as you called it. What's going to happen then? Um, I don't know, but I feel I might just go crazy. Okay. Yeah. So work with that emotion. Pray mm. about that emotion. Yeah, talk to God about, are you going to go crazy? What's going to happen? You know, the mm. truth... The truth is when we, when we come to these kind of places of terror, usually there's one or two or three core beliefs that we have that prevent us from getting from the terror or the fear down into the grief. And that's one of yours, is this, this viewpoint that you're going to go nuts. How many of you feel you're going to go nuts when you really start letting yourself feel? So there's quite a few, right? right. And that's a major blockage emotion that blocks us from actually feeling our emotions. When we get through that blocking emotion, we start to believe that we won't go nuts and that we'll be able to cope with everything. Right? But before that time, you actually believe that you are going to go nuts and that you're not going to cope with everything. That's what you believe. And that belief needs to leave you, just like all other beliefs. It can only leave you through an experience of feeling like you're going to go nuts and feeling like it's going to be so bad and then allowing yourself to grieve that feeling, you know, like to feel the grief of that feeling. Now, I feel there's probably a couple more of those kind of blocking feelings for you with your fear into your grief. But if you, all I do is I sit down and I imagine what's the worst possible thing that I could imagine happening in this situation? 
And whatever first comes to my mind is what I just go with. And I just imagine the worst, right, the worst possible scenario and just allow myself to connect with that emotionally. Because it doesn't mean it's true, right? It just allows, it's, it's what you feel is true. So go with that, let yourself feel all that. And if you let yourself feel that and go through it, you'll find you'll come out the other end no longer believing it. My father has recently died and um, I have had um, um, some way of connecting with him through someone and he is in quite a dark place mm -hmm. and um, my mother is still alive and I feel she might be even in a darker space mm -hmm. and I'm the product of both these my parents as biological parents and I have always this fear that I, if I died, I'd go to this very dark space and it frightens me. Um, so I realised that it went to another escape of saying, I realised when I was born, it, I constantly had this feeling of, I wish I was never born, with the understanding that this is incorrect, but feeling that all the time. Um, because if I die, I still got to deal with it. So if I wasn't born, I wouldn't have had to know any of this, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So there is this so much fear of um, who I am, what I've done in my ignorance to myself, but also all the people I've affected. And it's it's very it's very. Um, It's almost like beyond disgust and disbelief. It's it's almost horrifying to feel that mm -hmm. that one can be so um, the opposite of what God created me to be. No, and now you're getting close to this. You do now. Do this tears. Just yeah. cry about what you just said. Yeah, thank you. you need to yeah, you'll get through it. I've, I've felt so much self-disgust um, myself. I realise that a lot of the times when I say to myself, I wished I would never been born, or I wished I'd never been created, um, I was actually avoiding grief of this. So in other words, I created that, I wished I'd never been born, I wished I'd never been created, to avoid just feeling the grief of what I feel about myself in the end. And sometimes you hit emotions that you, you feel like, uh, I mean, uh, self-disgust is one for me at the moment as well. And I, I just pray so much, Lorleen, about it. Like, God, I don't want to feel, I don't want to feel all the shame I have about myself. I don't want to feel how far I am from you. I don't want to actually turn the light on and see my own soul um, because I feel so far, like, I feel so unworthy to be sitting in this chair you know and that helps just talk to God about that yeah yeah uh, Jen thank you and then Ray. um I keep seeing my father through members of my family um his personality thing the imprint of his personality with my sons. Still when I relate to Peter, I relate out of anger and I f see and feel my dad rather than Jeffrey or Nick or Peter. Mm -hmm. And that's been happening with Graham too. Mm -hmm. And so, I react when it's to my dad from the pits of hell inside of me and it does damage and it's an uncontrollable rage but what also what's also happening is that he's now sitting on my shoulder and masquerading as different people 
and he won't let go. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to let go mm -hmm. because I wanted him to love me and he never did. I have to, I have to ask you, I'm, I want to break free from this and I just see him walk between my conversations with men. He walks in front mm -hmm. and his face and his personality is there and that's all I can see and hear. Mm -hmm. And there's no chance for me to be able to relate. So you want to know how to do with that, Jen, right? Do you? Or what, yes, what I do. What would you like to know? I, sorry. That's okay. First of all, I want to be responding from my own soul, from a place of love. How can I hold on to that when it's so brand new? I don't feel like I've had me for very long. Mm -hmm. And I'm just finding out who I am. And I want to hang on to that, but I keep making mistakes because I see him in front of people. He even comes in front of women I talk to. Mm -hmm. And I can't see them or feel them or worse, relate to them. Mm -hmm. And I can't kick him off my shoulder. I don't, he's like here right now. Mm -hmm. He tells me things in my head from, he will tell me anything that he thinks will affect my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, where do I start? Please. Um, you probably have a lot more to say. <laughs> but you said before, Jen, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to to get rid of him because I wanted him to love me so much and he didn't love me. That's the emotion. That's how you free yourself from your dad, to feel that emotion to its completion. And it's a really hard one for you. But that's the emotion. Um, can I illustrate it for you? It's Please. <clears throat> um, you have a lot of grief about how your father has treated you, right? And, and I, over the top of that grief is a lot of fear about what that's created about yourself. Like, you, you're worried about who you are now. I'm ugly. <laughs> I feel, feel that ugliness in my relationships with people. Yeah. I feel it in my own body. It manifests in every aspect of my life because it's all messed up. Yeah. Yep. Can I just point out to you that I don't feel you're ugly, Jen, but you need to feel these emotions that you feel. Let's look at, let's look at them a lot more closely. You have some really terrible grief that dad, about your dad. But the problem is, is that grief is so big in you that you are afraid of feeling it, right? And instead what you want is the man to love you, right? So the projection at every single man around you is that he's got to love me, he's got to notice me, he's got to respect me, he's got to... Do you, you see that? That's the projection at every single man around you. And also towards many of the women as well because you feel very similar emotions sometimes about your mum as well, that she never loved you and cared for you. She allowed the abuse to happen. She knew about it. She'd sometimes even send dad to you, right? So, so you've got those kind of emotions too as well. There's some very big grief about that, right? And so with the women as well, there's sometimes that she's got to love me. She's got to care about me. She's got to notice me. She's got to listen to me. So there's that heavy projection that goes from you to both genders. But that heavy projection is coming because there's a desire for you to get away from the, f the grief you feel, right? And it's that desire to get away from this grief that creates the f you're afraid of your grief and that's what creates the, the anger for you. 
And this is like a rage. Every time you try to get away from the grief, you will go into this rage. Now, can I just explain what's happening to you with your dad? Because you're in a rage with your dad and he feels that this rage is unjustified, he now wants to make your life as hard as he can make it. What so triggered me to the <laughs> fact that it was actually him, mm -hmm. that the, the major spirit influence that I have is actually him, yeah. was that he tried to convince me that, that I had misjudged him the whole of my life, that because of what happened to me at three, that I then misjudged and I... I brought everything that he, the way that he behaved towards me. Yeah, no, he, see, you're, yeah, and you're dead right. He did and, say that. And I'm, I knew it's that couldn't true. possibly be true. Of course. Of course it's not true. The truth is that your father is in a very, very dark place. And the truth is in the spirit world, he's, in the place he is, he hasn't even visited the spirit world yet because he'd be totally terrified to visit where he's actually belong, going to belong for a while because of his dark condition. So what he's doing instead is he feels your rage, right, with him, and he connects to that. He feels that he's not to blame for what you're projecting at him. That's what he feels. Now, he's wrong. <laughs> he created all of this in you, right? Most of it, actually, he created in you. But... This is what he believes. He believes that you, he, you have no justifiable reason for him to be in a rage with him. He feels that he is justified abusing his three-year-old daughter or five-year-old daughter or seven-year-old daughter or nine-year-old daughter. He feels totally justified in abusing you sexually and abusing you violently. He feels totally justified with it. And your mum, by the way, feels totally justified in allowing it as well. All right? This is his, this is, I'm just telling you his feelings. But his feelings are way, way out of harmony with taking any responsibility. Right? However, what's happening is, because you're in a rage with him and haven't yet got through to feeling your grief about what he's done, he feels he now wants to punish you even more. Right? This is what he feels, that he wants to punish you even more because you're in an unjustified rage with him. That's what he feels. I'm just telling you what he feels. And that's why he's there trying to torment you a lot. All right? Now, the thing that will disconnect you is what Mary's pointed out, and that is to feel your grief about your dad. Once you start feeling your grief, you will no longer project rage at your father, and so then he will have no justification to actually cause you any issues or problems because you've now released out of the area of rage. You're not, at the moment, all of your rage towards your father.